There was such an intense focus on energy savings that we choked off our air supply in our buildings and we ushered in this sick building era. It was a huge mistake. The levels you're breathing right now are influencing your ability to process information and be productive. But we don't always ascribe that to the building. Filters that rely on an electrostatic charge can be a problem because particularly with wildfire smoke, the majority of your exposure to outdoor air pollution happens inside. Welcome. I'm here with Professor Joe Allen from the Harvard School of Public Health. And if you're someone who spends any time inside homes, buildings, and cars, you're going to want to listen to Dr. Allen. He is the director of the Harvard Healthy Buildings Program and an authority on practical ways that we can fix the indoor air we breathe to improve our health, to protect ourselves from pollution and wildfire smoke, and also improve our cognitive performance, as his own published research has shown. Dr. Allen, thanks for coming back on the show. And I'm excited to talk about specific strategies in a minute, but I want to start broadly. Why should people care about the indoor air they breathe? Does it matter that much? Uh, yeah, it matters a whole lot. And so let me first say thanks for having me back on and thanks for having me on in the middle of the pandemic when not many people are paying attention to indoor air quality. So I appreciate you helping get that message out. Um, yeah, indoor air quality matters a lot. I think a lot of people have finally woken up to that because of COVID, but but let's do some simple math on this and explain why, uh, if someone's not convinced. Um, we spend nearly all of our time indoors. The stat is you spend 90% of your time indoors. We're an indoor species. I think you probably don't need to hear more than that to understand that the air you breathe inside of your home, office, school, car, airplane, coffee shop, grocery store, matters a whole lot to your health. Before we get into strategies to optimize the indoor air we breathe, can you explain the difference between outdoor and indoor sources of air pollution and how they might be related? Yeah, sure. So this is really quite important because, um, all right, clearly you have indoor sources of air pollution. It could be gases that come off or emit from your gas stove. It could be scented cleaners you use. It could be off-gassing from wood floor or paint could be um, allergens from pets, cats, dogs, but also unwanted pests like roaches and, uh, and mice and other rodents. So you have this mix in the indoor space. And if you think about it, we tend to live in these boxes, right? Uh, and with a lot of these indoor sources, they'll accumulate and build up unless you're doing things to remove them. So sure, people clean surfaces, you try to get rid of dust, that'll help with some allergen loading and things like that. But we don't really do much to clean the indoor air. A lot of people think about outdoor air pollution, and that's important. It kills millions of people globally every year. But the dirty secret of outdoor air pollution is that it penetrates inside. And even though your building, depending on how it's configured, can reduce the amount of air pollution coming in, because you spend 90% of your time indoors, the majority of your exposure to outdoor air pollution happens inside. That probably sounds wild to people. Because I know if you look at a news story when they say it's a bad air pollution day, what do they say? Go inside. Uh, they'll show a picture of somebody outside in smog. But most of the air pollution you're breathing from outdoor air pollution happens inside. So you have these indoor sources, and then you have all that outdoor air pollution that penetrates inside. Yes, the amount you breathe about the air pollution is higher when you're outside, but you're out there for so much shorter uh, periods of time. And you do the math on it. Your total dose of the total amount you breathe can be three, four, five, six, even 10 times higher than what you'd breathe outside. So you have all these things driving uh, exposures. And again, it comes down to this fact we're breathing. Most of the air we breathe, we breathe indoors. So what are some practical things people can do right away to improve their indoor air quality? I think there's a couple of simple things, and it really depends on uh, what kind of space we're talking about. But let's start with homes. Um, I think there are some absolute basics. I think you want to be careful about the products you use. Uh, can we uh, have uh, you know low emitting um, products, reduce the VOC load? If you have a stove, it should absolutely be vented or exhausted. A lot of these vents or exhaust just recirculate there. It has to be exhausted to the outside. Open your windows as much as you can, when you can. Um, we got to keep the dust loading low, keep out dust and pests, use green cleaners so we're not uh, putting toxic chemicals uh, inside our, our homes. I think also some basics, things like take your shoes off when you come inside, so you're not dragging in anything that you bring in from outside. I think that's good pra practice. Um, I'd like to see us ventilate our homes a bit more, bring in a bit more outdoor air, upgrade the level of filtration, 
depending on your location or area or issue, you could use a portable air cleaner to clean out some of the airborne particles. You could use humidifiers to, to condition the air uh, a bit more. So it, it, the short answer is it depends a lot on the type of space we're talking about and the type of building or, or local issue. Um, but there's a there's a guide that might be helpful to people. My Harvard Healthy Buildings program put out a report we called 36 Expert Tips for a Healthier Home. Should be really simple. A couple of these simple tips like take your shoes off uh, when you come in the door, but also things like choosing better products or when you cook. Make sure when you cook, you can generate particles that'll make it look like a bad outdoor air pollution day inside your home. So have that exhaust running, open a window, crack that open. Otherwise, these particles will linger uh, for quite a long time. So hopefully that report's helpful. Lots of good tips in there. And then we tried to keep it really straightforward. Excellent. So I I live in Oregon and right now we have a lot of wildfire smoke and it's been lingering for, for weeks now. Um, I think the, the AQI, which we'll hopefully talk about in a minute, has been up above 150 for about a week. So you mentioned one of the strategies is, of course, bringing more outside air yeah. in. But when pollution levels are high or wildfire smoke levels are high, um, then kind of what are your main strategies? And you, you mentioned some of them there, but just to kind of reinforce that. Yeah, I think we have to think about our building system. So we want to bring as much outdoor as possible. But again, of course, if outdoor pollution is bad, wildfire, smoke, then you really need to rely on filtration. So if you're in a building with a central system, you want to be sure you've upgraded your filters. So we're talking about the same things for COVID. Most buildings have what's called a MERV-8 filter, low-grade filter, protects equipment, not people. Upgrade to a MERV-13 filter or higher. I like the idea of running your systems if you have a mechanical system. Some people say, well, you got to turn it off when there's wildfire or outdoor air pollution is bad. You still want to run it because you want to control the point of entry into the building and then run it through your high-grade filters. And then when your system is operating, all the recirculated air goes back through filter bank too. And it helps to keep the building positively pressurized a little bit if it's done right. So you don't have particle infiltration from nooks and crannies in the building. That's outside of open windows and things like that. So you want to run your system, but you definitely want to upgrade your level of filters. If you don't have a central system, portable air cleaners can be really effective. Look for a portable air cleaner with a HEPA filter. Same exact advice we gave during COVID. We can put in links to the Harvard Healthy Buildings Program. We built some tools to help you size it right for the room. doesn't make sense to get a small filter in a huge room. That won't do much. Also, you don't need to oversize it uh, for, for uh, you know, a regular sized room. So it's a couple of these simple strategies that, I, that can be really effective. And all you're trying to do is decrease the particle concentrations that come into your uh, come into your home. For people who aren't familiar, you mentioned the MERV 13 filter. Where are, in a typical home or apartment, where are these filters located? Yeah, so if you're in a bigger building, multifamily, you're gonna have a mostly gonna have a central system, or if you're gonna have an in-room system, and it's just the basic filter that's designed that's in every every furnace or every uh, air conditioning system. And usually, though, it's a low-grade filter that's kind of designed to protect the equipment from like big particles, right? And they're pretty cheap, and you uh, you swap them in and out. But for not much more, really a couple dollars more, you can get these MERV 13. And MERV, if you're not familiar, it's just a rating system. So you look for a MERV-13 filter, a higher performance filter, that'll start to capture 80 or 90% of these particles. Whereas a MERV-8, you could be down at 20%, depending on the particle size. So again, a simple strategy um, like that, which doesn't cost much, really a couple bucks, will do a lot to improve your health. Protects when it's a wildfire issue, helps against respiratory viruses like COVID and influenza, uh, helps against uh, allergens or, or other uh, particle-based allergens that are in the home, cat dander. Uh, or dog dander, right? These are the basic filtration that works against all these different types of particles. And why a MERV 13 filter specifically, and why not like a MERV 16 or even a HEPA filter in your home, you know, air conditioning and heating system? Yeah, really good question. I, I think, um, you know, you should go as high as you can. And by that, I mean, um, when you get the higher grade filters, they can tax the, the fan a bit more. You could imagine a higher grade filter is harder to push air through. So your, your system has to work harder. Um, it's not necessarily that we don't want even better filters, but really if you look at the science, particularly around respiratory pathogens, there's a point of diminishing returns. So, you know, I think it's a really good advice to say MERV 13 or higher. If you can get to MERV 13, I think that's great. If you go higher, I think that's great. Most building systems aren't gonna handle a HEPA filter. That's mostly what you're going to find in, um, let's say, hospitals or uh, you know, a patient room in a healthcare clinic or the standalone portable air cleaners, 
which are the fans or the motors in there are designed to handle pushing air through a HEPA filter. So portable air cleaner, think about a HEPA filter for your home. Think about one of these MERV 13 filters or get as high as you can. If the best you can do is a MERV 11, do that. You got to get off the low grade filters though. Got it. Okay. So someone's taking the initiative to replace their MERV 8 filters or whatever came kind of stock in their system with a MERV 13 filter. Probably a good idea to write the date on the filter when you install it. Um, and then how how often should these be changed? How do you know when to change them? And what is the consequence if you forget about it and don't change it for a long time? Yes, yeah, so that's a really good question. And, and uh, my team put out an advisory recently that, um, uh, that I hope people pay attention to. And it relates to actually MERV 13 filters and other filters. So a lot of these filters, there's a couple of different mechanisms by which particles get trapped onto filter fibers. Some filters rely on an electrostatic charge. So a typical filter that doesn't rely on a charged media, as we call it, a charged filter, you can replace it every six or 12 months, whatever the manufacturer says. I think that's fine. It's not going to be a big loading issue. And the filter is going to work fine even when there's uh, extra particles or air pollution or dust on it. But these filters that rely on an electrostatic charge are, can be a problem because particularly with wildfire smoke. So wildfire smoke also has a charge. And you can think of it as the charge getting used up. So you get a wildfire smoke, you get a lot of smoke inundating your filters. They're doing a good job protecting you. But over time, they're going to keep impacting out on this fibers or relying the, 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 uh, the filtrations relying on the, the charge to attract these particles to the filter fiber. And you can essentially use them up or wear it out. And some studies have shown that can, there can be up to a 95% reduction in the capture efficiency after these filters are exposed to smoke, cigarette smoking or wildfire smoke. So we put out an advisory this summer. I didn't see anybody talking about it. With all the wildfires that happened, I didn't see any reports of people talking about the challenges of charged filter media, these electrostatic charges. So we have a nice blog uh, on our Harvard Healthy Buildings page that uh, describes this nice little graphic, but also explains the science for anyone who wants to dive deep on it. But really important, if you have one of these filters that's electrostatically charged, uh, you need to replace it after a smoke event. So after a wildfire season or after a couple of days of really bad wildfire smoke, it's smart to change it at that point. And is a typical MERV 13 filter, let's say put out by 3M or one of the other major companies, are they electrostatically charged? So it really depends on the manufacturer and the filter in terms of how they're achieving these um, uh, this performance. I've looked into this and I'm not an expert in the supply chain on filters, but my understanding is that most filters you buy from local hardware stores, including big box stores, are electrostatic. Interesting. So for most homeowners going out and purchasing one of these, um, these are the kind of filters you want to either replace more frequently. You want to have good filters, right? Number one. But if you have them, I'd buy a couple, particularly for an area that's prone to heavy amounts of wildfire smoke, and just swap them out after the event um, so you keep getting that protection. Okay. Or if you're in, you know, a place like Southern Oregon, where you know, we, we kind of have a fifth season now, we call it smoke season, where <laughs> smoke can linger for, for months sometimes. So yeah, it, I think it behooves one to really look for the, the non-electrostatically charged filters, right? Because then the, the, presumably the life would be longer of that filter. In a yeah, I totally way. agree. I totally agree. I, I think one of the challenges here is I think we put a lot on the consumer. Like I don't think people should be expert have to be experts on filter or electrostatic charges. Um, and so and, and I, it shouldn't be a barrier to getting a better filter. Get a better filter, find the upgraded filter. And yes, if you're in an area that has uh, wildfire smoke after a heavy um, uh, amount comes through, then it's smart to change the filters. And, and I think it's good, Kyle, to talk about one other thing related to these wildfires because we're talking about Oregon and Pacific Northwest, right? Inundated with wildfire smoke, your smoke season. Uh, we saw on the East Coast for the first time in my lifetime, certainly we saw a wildfire event that surprised everybody. But very importantly, I want to talk about the West Coast fires and point out that even um, when the smoke is intense on the West Coast, it's not just a West Coast problem. There are studies and measurement data showing that when we have wildfire smoke on the West Coast, we can see the air pollution all the way on the East Coast of the United States. So it blankets the country. 
It's not the thick levels you're all used to, or you, know, you can walk out and smell, or when it hit the East Coast in New York City, the sky was orange. It's not like that. But you can measure this, and it actually leads to exceedances of health-based levels. So sometimes we think of these regional events, but they're all connected, right? Air pollutants travel uh, hundreds and thousands of miles. And so we can even detect West Coast wildfires on the East Coast of the U.S. And yeah, if you look at smoke maps, like most people in Oregon are really adept at looking at smoke maps now. You can see that. You can see the 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 smoke drift all the way over, you know, to the other to the other coast. It's it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, we um, see this if you look at um, air air pollution coming from coal fired power plants in China. We can detect this on the west coast of the U.S. Right, wow. air pollutants travel thousands of miles. But you think about these news stories, and it's like, oh, there's a wildfire an air pollution issue in Oregon. Well, that's not just an Oregon issue or the New York issue. It wasn't just a, a an East Coast issue. So, you know, this actually blankets um, the country. So even people who aren't, who don't think of themselves in a wildfire impacted location, uh, you actually can see these higher levels of outdoor air pollutants. And again, the outdoor air pollution and outdoor particles and smoke penetrate inside your home. I want to get back to HEPA filtration, the, the portable HEPA filters, because for, as you mentioned, if you're heating an air conditioning system with the, the upgraded filters, the MERV 13 filters, can't really keep up with the demand of, let's say, smoke or outdoor air pollution, then it sounds like a good strategy is to add in HEPA, portable HEPA air cleaners. Um, I know you mentioned this last time we spoke, but just to to reinforce what to look for in a good HEPA air um, purifier because it can be daunting. I, I just bought another one recently, and there's a lot of marketing to wade through, and it's hard to figure out sizing and do you need ionization and UV filtration or not. So, kind of, yeah, maybe if you could go over some of the basics of what to look for. Yeah, I think it's a good reminder um, and uh, uh, of what to look for, and a good reminder to keep it simple, like the classic maxim without the 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 end there. So you want to keep it really simple, and the way to do it is to look for an air cleaner with a HEPA filter and nothing else. You don't need any of these bells and whistles, extra cleaning, avoid you know claims better than HEPA. I mean, HEPA, cap HEPA filters capture 99.97% of particles at its worst performing particle size. So usually it's better than 99.97. Anybody that's out there claiming better than HEPA, HEPA plus, any of this, you don't really need it. Uh, some have sensors, some have remote controls. That's fine as a consumer, whatever you wanna, whatever widget you wanna buy, that's fine. But I would just look for a, a device that has a HEPA filter and you wanna size it right. One of the challenges of figuring out the right size for the room that it's gonna be used in is that some um, uh, there's some metrics out there you can use and a lot of the devices on the packaging, they'll use different metrics and they'll say, this is good for a 500 square foot room, 700 square foot room, but there's not a lot of standardization. I'm not saying you shouldn't trust what the manufacturer says, but I what I like to do is use what's called uh, a clean air delivery rate. So if you're into this, look up the CADR, clean air delivery rate, on the device. My rule of thumb is you want 300 CADR for every 500 square feet of space. So if you have a 500 square foot room, look for a device that has a HEPA filter with at least a 300 CADR. Most manufacturers report the CADR. If they don't, that's telling too. So I think that's really helpful. If that sounds complicated or too much, and you want like a tool specific to your space, again, there's another tool at the Harvard Healthy Buildings Program website where you enter in the size of your space. It tells the height of the ceiling, the size of your room, and it'll tell you what CADR exactly to look for. And we're trying to get to what we call four or five air changes per hour. So you wanna turn over the amount of air in the space four or five times an hour, right? You're constantly cleaning that air. And if you do get a device with a, the rule of thumb, 300 CADR for 500 square feet, you're right in that sweet spot. I use portable air cleaners in my house um, and they, they're really effective and they're good when you're cooking and you see the particle uh, levels increase and they're good just for constantly cleaning the, um, the air in the background. I've heard you mention this before. You mentioned clean air delivery rate, but what does the average home or building or apartment in the United States get as far as uh, air changes per hour. Yeah, so with typical homes, we think about air changes per hour as a way we think about how much outdoor air is coming in. Uh, and I'll convert it to like a clean air metric in a section, but let's just talk about this air changes per hour number. So we've been recommending since early in the pandemic, four to six air changes per hour, right? Turn over that air four or six times. You want clean air. 
typical home in the U.S. gets half an air change per hour, right? So it could be 10 times lower than what we're recommending. Typical school can be one and a half or one air change per hour, way too low. So air change per hour is the metric we think about outdoor air, but there's an equivalent or an air change per hour equivalent is the official term. But you can think about any combination of clean air through outdoor air or filtered air. So let's say you get half an air change per hour from outside, then you want your portable air cleaner to get you at least three and a half or four air changes from filtration. So the combined total is in that four to six air change per hour. Hope that didn't sound too complicated. It's actually really quite simple concept, four to six air changes. You wanna turn over that air four to six times per hour. And you can do this from outdoor air or from filtered air. And you wanna just pick a device that'll help you get there knowing that most homes have re are really tight and don't, uh, don't breathe a lot. You don't get a lot of air exchange with outdoor air and many don't have filtration. And then what about carbon filters? Of course, the claim is that carbon filters can help with VOCs, volatile organic compounds, something we haven't talked about yet. But do you think that's something to consider as part of your portable HEPA air cleaners? So, yeah, so when we think about these air pollutants, you can think about two different classes. Mostly we've been talking about particles right now. So filters capture these particles. It's physical, right? And then you have gas phase pollutants like volatile organic compounds or the benzene, maybe people familiar with from gas and fuels. These are gases. So they go right past these filters. So, but you can have these activated carbon or organic filters. So you'd have the filter that captures the particles, and then you'd have carbon that would capture the gas, right? Some of the challenges there are it's really one, they're more expensive than these kind of MERV 13 filters, HEPA filters are generally pretty cheap. The other thing is they can saturate. So a filter capturing particles doesn't really saturate. I mean, it saturates, but it's just collecting gook. And the more particles that are on it, it actually filters better. The organic media, the carbon media will capture the gases, but at some point there's all the gases are captured. There's no more spots for gas. So it's just going to slip through. There's no more absorption happening or absorption happening. So um, so it becomes hard to figure out when you need to change it and, be and it becomes expensive. I wouldn't go to carbon-based filters unless I had a problem. So I think we can do better on the source side, controlling VOCs. Um, but uh, I think it's it's difficult and expensive to do. That said, we're talking about wildfire smoke. And I've been thinking a lot about uh, Maui and the after effects, not the active smoke event. But you get a lot of these gas phase pollutants. There's lots of talk about filters and HEPA filters and N95 masks, even for responders. But those capture the particles, but not the gases. So if I was in a place like that, if I was in a place like Maui, we're going to get these resuspended particles and gases, I think it would be a good idea. It leaves in the interim to have filters that capture both particles and gases and the respirators responders are using should not just be N95s because that's only capturing the particles. You also want the cartridge-based, carbon-based, activated charcoal-based filters that will capture some of the gas. So I, that was a lot in there, but it, you know, this is where my head has been thinking about Maui and thinking about, okay, you have particle-based pollutants, you have these gases, uh, and there's issues related to wildfire smoke around both, and the filtration is different. Yeah, makes sense. Something you mentioned earlier that I want to come back to um, just to make sure we hit on it is you mentioned how if you run your fan in your HVAC system, your air conditioning or heating system through those MERV 13 filters, and then maybe you're using uh, portable HEPA air cleaners as well. If no one's in your home from, let's say, nine to five during the day, everyone's at work or school, do you, is it a good idea during kind of uh, when, when air pollution levels are high or smoke level, ambient levels of smoke are high to keep those running all day so the house stays pressurized? Or is it, can it be acceptable to turn them off and then just turn them on again right when you get home? Yeah, well, two different concepts there. When I was talking about the pressurization, I'm talking about the, the central mechanical systems, right? That are bringing a lot of air. You're kind of pumping it through the building. The portable systems aren't going to pressurize your building. But, but it's a good question on, you know, when do you run these things? So clearly you want to run them when air pollution is bad. Uh, when you're cooking, you could run them. But I actually run mine all the time. I think it becomes a question of um, cost. There's an energy cost. Most of these things don't use a lot of energy. Um, because the reason is this, as you said, you have this constant smoke season and this constant background. So maybe you're not getting the alert every day, but yeah, you see the smoke maps. 
And these particles enter into your home and they'll settle, right? They'll settle. I mean, allergens, I mean, um, uh, you know, just dust from outside, ash, smoke, outdoor air pollution. And then you resuspend them. So this is uh, a dated reference, but you know, the pig pen uh, character, this uh, cartoon character walks around, they, they have a dust cloud around them. Well, it's, there's a truth to it. We all have this personal dust cloud. And so when you're walking through your home, folding laundry, you sit on a chair, you're constantly resuspending dust. And so it's not just the case, yeah, well, you're in the home, you're breathing, you want the air cleaners going, but they're, if they're operating in the background, you're kind of capturing all this kind of anything that infiltrates during the day when you aren't there, anything that's resuspended. So I like to run mine, um, and it's, but uh, but I get the under, I get you know people wanting to maximize uh, um, their their exposure uh, reduction and when and waiting for a big event or are concerned about energy costs, but yep. they don't consume all that much energy. And speaking of energy costs, if Outdoor air pollution levels are low. I know you're a big advocate, like you said, of of opening up windows, bringing more outdoor air in. Um, but of course, if it's hot or cold outside, there's an energy cost and expense to that too. So, do you feel like having indoor, clean indoor air, optimal indoor air, is kind of at odds with energy conservation? No, I think it's been presented that way for a long time. I mean, clearly, there's a relationship between energy, climate, and buildings and comfort. But I think we've had too narrow a view. And I wrote about this in Harvard Business Review in January, saying as the pendulum swings away from COVID, public's attention is shifting towards climate as another crisis. We can't think of the so-called green building or energy efficient movement separate from the healthy building movement. That's what we've been fed for 40 years. In fact, that's what led to the sick building era. There was such an intense focus on energy savings that we choked off our air supply in our buildings and we ushered in this sick building era. It was a huge mistake. It's a huge mistake. We paid the price for decades, but really paid the price during COVID. So this idea that you know you can't have both is, is actually false. So take a, a building. What do you want to do? So you want to bring in as much outdoor as possible. You want to be sure that you're filtering that air. You also want to be sure that any of the air you're cooling, conditioning, heating, isn't just wasted, exhausted out of the building. So we do things like energy recovery ventilation, where you capture that heat or cooling and you pass it back through the incoming air supply. So you retain or don't lose all that energy you spent to condition the space. We need to use demand control ventilation, which really means you just put a sensor in the space so that you're bringing air in when and where people are. Go into any commercial building right now, office space, and you'll see we're dumping in tons of air in an empty conference room or a place that is one person working. You can actually modulate to save energy and deliver air when and where it's needed. So we have to deploy that as a tactic. The biggest issue is we have to clean our grid, right? It's fossil fuel based in most parts of the country, most parts of the world. Our buildings are massive consumers of the energy and electricity that's generated from fossil fuel combustion. If we have a clean energy grid, the, the environmental costs of heating, cooling, extra ventilation of buildings becomes should become close to zero right? Because it's not fossil fuel based. So we're making these decisions right now. Hey, we have to save energy. I agree. That's really important. But we've done it for 40 years at the expense of human health. I find that totally unacceptable, especially when we have solutions for both. But you hear this constantly. Oh, we can't do that because it's going to be it's going to hurt our climate goals. Well, there's actually pathways to do it. In fact, I advise JP Morgan Chase, and they have a new headquarters going up in midtown Manhattan. All electric tower sourced from renewable energies, double the minimum ventilation rate, maximum filtration, real-time indoor air quality sensors and monitors, demand control ventilation. It can totally be done. But I remember these conversations years ago. It's, oh, it can't be done. We can't bring in that much outdoor. It's not possible. So we got to get around the what's not possible and, and actually point to examples that this is really possible. It doesn't just have to be the shiny new building in midtown Manhattan. There are examples all over the place of people doing this. Absolutely. And can you talk about the what's known about the health and cognitive performance impacts of, let's say, optimal air versus acceptable air and then versus low air quality indoors, which most people have and, and most people in our schools have, most kids have as well? Yeah, I mean, let's take schools, for example. Um, there are studies, many studies, showing that when we have lower ventilation, so worse air quality, Kids perform worse on reading tests. They perform worse on math tests. When the air is too hot, they're more likely to fail standardized tests. 
When the air quality is bad, they're more likely to be absent. They're more likely to have asthma attacks. And by the way, these are studies in every age group in, in every country studied. It's not like we see this. We see it in college students. We see it in elementary kids. We see it in middle school kids, high school kids, every grade, everywhere we look. Apply that to offices, our own work on worker cognitive function. We just finished a global study showing the impact of particles, so pollution, right at someone's desk, pollution that comes inside, and we measure cognitive function at the same time. And we see an acute effect, I meaning the levels you're breathing right now are influencing your ability to process information and be productive. So we don't know it, but I think if you ask people, they sense it, but they don't know, right? So it's not like everyone's running around with an air quality monitor, but you've been in a space, you say, ah, I don't feel right here, I have a headache, I can't concentrate. But we don't always ascribe that to the building. Right? Ah, this is Something's wrong in this space, but we all know spaces you walk in, and wow, do you feel good, the air quality is good, beautifully designed space, natural light penetrating in, right? And you're, you you get in flow, you're, you're in the zone. And so the building's having this big impact, and so we tend to think about health as uh, a lot of people do is, as disease avoidance or the absence of disease. And that's been the big focus, COVID-19, influenza, RSV, getting a lot of attention. But there are, there's all these all these other positive benefits to well-being, cognitive function, um, feeling well, feeling your best. And air quality is uh, linked through all of that. Uh, everything from, you know, uh, the infectious disease through uh, performing better at work or at school. And do these same principles that you've been talking about with, uh, you know, ventilation, bringing more outdoor in, air in, um, filtering air, does, do they apply to vehicles as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I'll give you an example um, from our own research. And it's a, it's a vehicle, all right, but you probably were thinking about cars, but I'm going to talk about airplanes. So we, do, we did a study. I was doing these studies of worker cognitive function and air quality. And we saw that workers who were in offices with poor air quality were performing west, worse on tests of higher order cognitive function, tests of strategy, information seeking, crisis response. At the same time, I'd been doing studies of airplane air quality sponsored by the FAA. And I saw data on air quality in airplanes and it immediately hit me. What is the air quality in the cockpit and is it influencing pilot performance? So we did a study in a flight simulator, brand new flight simulator with active commercial airline pilots. And we challenged them with 21 advanced maneuvers, engine flame out on takeoff, uh, mid-air collision avoidance, flaps not working on landing, you know, difficult maneuvers. And we changed the air quality in the flight simulator without them knowing. So we had them fly these multiple routines. Sure enough, sure enough, in the cockpits with worse air quality, the pilots were more likely to fail on these tests of advanced maneuvers using the same test the FAA uses. So we use data from the airplane, the flight simulator, and a certified FAA rater who was watching the pilot's performance in the back, just like they have to certify normally. So air quality in the cockpit is influencing pilot performance. So this is what I mean about it being universal. We talk about schools, offices, right? we could talk about all this, but it extends to pilots. We've seen worse air quality in cars if they're not ventilated right. So it's pretty universal that the air we're breathing is influencing our performance. That should be obvious, I think. Um, but we're what we're doing with these studies is quantifying that uh, that impact. How can a typical person watching this that um, you know maybe doesn't work at a, a fancy office building, is, is there a way that they can monitor? their indoor air um, relatively inexpensively? Yeah, I'd say there's a, a revolution underway and, uh, and, a, and a change in the power dynamic uh, because now there are lower cost air quality sensors. Some could be a hundred bucks, some could be 200 bucks. So not cheap, but certainly in the range that uh, becomes um, affordable for some people to purchase these. Where in the past, it used to be thousands of dollars. In the past, you'd hire someone like me. I'm a certified industrial hygienist. No one knows what that is. We go out and do air quality samples, send it to a lab, maybe have a $10,000 piece of equipment. But now you can buy these, they're pocket size, and people are doing it. And they go into um, uh, an office or, or a coffee shop and, and they measure carbon dioxide. So CO2 is a great proxy or indicator of ventilation. High CO2, it's underventilated. We're the main source of CO2 inside as we breathe. 
So there's really a shift happening. And if you look across social media, people are measuring air quality in all sorts of spaces and many times even shaming companies or buildings. Company X, why is the carbon dioxide concentration 2,000 parts per million? I read that Harvard likes it under 1,000 parts per million. New CDC guidance is under 800. We put on 800 part per million standard for CO2 during, uh, during COVID. And now, so no one had any idea what CO2 levels were in a space, but you know now you have these little sensors uh, and you can find that out pretty quickly. Now, it's not everything you'd want to know, but uh, certainly tells you very quickly whether or not the space is uh, underventilated or if the particle levels are really high. After our last conversation, I got one of the one of these portable CO2 sensors. And you can see right now it's reading just below 800. So that's kind of in that acceptable range, you said. Um, but really, you know, this is this is handy to have because if, if it gets over a thousand, it's a cue to me that I need to open up a window if the air quality is okay outside. If not, turn on yeah. a, a portable HEPA air cleaner. But you mentioned in your book, uh, Healthy Buildings, that testing in schools, I think it was the example you gave was in Texas. I think one in five schools was over 3,000. I mean, just exceedingly high levels of CO2 inside the classroom. And it's just shocking the impact that can have on students. Yeah, I mean, it's extraordinary. These levels are really quite high um, at 3,000 parts per million. Nice job having yours under 800. Just for reference, 1,000 parts per million used to be the old rule of thumb. That's the acceptable level. We want to see under 800 parts per million now, so you're doing good. Um, but think about that, that dynamic shift. It used to have to be a scientist goes out, studies CO2, carbon dioxide in schools for a couple months, and writes a paper and reports on it, right? We're all relying on that one paper. Now, there's tens of thousands of you out there with these little devices going into schools and doing it. And in fact, Boston Public Schools, who I advised during the pandemic, deployed a real-time air quality monitor system in all their classrooms, and they report the data to parents and the public. That's a big shift. I know one or two other schools doing that, but that starts to tell you people are aware of this. The technology is available, it's relatively cheap. And now people have information that they never had about air quality in schools, offices, or wherever. Fantastic. Well, Professor Allen, I got to let you go. I know you have another meeting coming up, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for leading the charge, not only on indoor air quality, but also things like forever chemicals and the team the, the work that you and your team are are doing is, is so important. So thank you. Well, thanks for having me on. I mean, the work doesn't mean anything if it just stays in a dusty journal. So it's outlets like these that we rely on to get the message out. So I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks. And we'll, we'll link to all the um, resources, including your Harvard Healthy Buildings website and, and your book. And uh, again, really appreciate your time. All right. Great. Thanks so much. <laughs>